Hello and welcome to The Literary Lair. In case you aren't aware, I am a fan of The Beatles, and my favorite Beatles album is Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which is turning 50 this week. And I have a confession to make. I unironically love the Robert Stidwood-produced Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band movie starring Peter Frampton and the Bee Gees. Like, I don't like it because it's bad, or because it's so bad it's good, I just genuinely like the movie. But even as someone who likes the movie, I was shocked that there was a comic book adaptation of it. And I was even more shocked that there was a novelization of the movie. I'm sure you're probably thinking, how the hell do you have a novelization of a movie based on a Beatles album? Especially since the movie didn't really have dialogue outside of the narration from George Burns. I mean, the comic book made sense because at least the movie had cool and unique visuals that can be replicated on the pages of a comic book. But a novelization? I mean, not only do we lose the music, but we lose the visuals too. Well, the author, Henry Edwards, who actually wrote the screenplay to the movie, finds a way to make it work. And the book actually answers a lot of the questions that I had with the movie. Unfortunately, it just raises more questions than it answers. Anyway, let's not waste any more time and celebrate the 50th anniversary of my favorite Beatles album and look at Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. cover is garbage. I mean, it would look really great if it was just the Sgt. Pepper logo, but it's ruined by the images of Peter Frampton, George Burns, and the Bee Gees on the bottom. They're just so out of place. If the cover was a publicity shot or something, I'd get it, but they're just standing there in the void. Other than that, we get a little blurb. From the greatest rock album ever made something I partially agree with, to the $12 million movie starring Peter Frampton and the Bee Gees. Wait a minute, was the budget really that high? Oh my god, it was. Now this year's most spectacular novel. Considering that this was released in 1978, the same year as not only Splinter of the Mind's Eye, but also Sideways Stories from Wayside School, The Stand, and The Westing Game, I think that title isn't very accurate. So, yeah, everything about the cover, save for the logo, is just wrong. Let's get to the story. The story revolves around the town of Heartland. They were once home to the war-stopping musical group led by Sgt. Pepper and his Lonely Hearts Club band. We open during World War I, which they stopped with their music, and go through the band's history through every major social and economic movements in the intervening decades. And we find out the answer to a question that every other person who looked at the movie or one of its adaptations had. Did Sgt. Pepper liberate the concentration camps? The answer is no. The book states that they were with Glenn Miller and the Andrews sisters on an aircraft carrier in the South Pacific and doesn't say that they were anywhere near the European theater. That's already made me love this book because it means that there aren't any more uncomfortable images of Sgt. Pepper liberating Holocaust survivors with a jaunty tune. Anyway, naturally, Heartland wants to celebrate and honor them, and do so by erecting a weather vane. I would have went with a statue or something like that, but I guess a weather vane works. Might as well honor them with a refrigerator magnet. 
Anyway, during the ceremony, Sergeant Pepper sadly passes away, and he leaves a will, which leaves his instruments to the city of Heartland, so the city will always be one of happiness and joy. And to his daughter, her husband, and her evil stepson, he leaves his farm and instructions on keeping it running. Yeah, you heard right. Evil stepson Dougie Shears. And it's not like the kid's a teenager or an adult. The kid is seven. All seven-year-olds are assholes, so calling this one out in your will is really crappy. And it all seems to be stemming from the fact that Dougie's mother was a free spirit and walked out on Dougie's dad, leaving him to marry Sergeant Pepper's daughter. Don't blame the kid because of his mother or the fact that he might be a little averse to his father remarrying. He's a kid. I'm starting to hate Sergeant Pepper. And to Sergeant Pepper's biological grandson, Billy Shears, he leaves his purple staff and instructions to reform the Lonely Hearts Club band when he's ready. He even tells him to include his friends, Barry, Maurice, and Robin Gibb. I mean Mark, Dave, and Bob Henderson. And he does, reforming them when they're older, with Dougie as their manager. And we get to a song, where I want to ask you, how did you think that they were going to incorporate the songs into the novelization? Were they incorporated into the dialogue? Was it stated that they sang the song? Were the songs left out? Nope. They just put the lyrics to the song smack dab in the middle of the page. Which only really works if you've heard the songs before. I mean, I have, but what if someone picked this up and hadn't heard the songs? I mean, it's unlikely, but it is possible to come across this book without having seen the movie, especially considering the movie's relative obscurity compared to Stigwood's other works, and there are people out there who just don't like the Beatles. It's just words. I mean, I guess it makes for nice poetry, but I don't think this was the best way to incorporate the songs. Anyway, they sing and were introduced to Billy's childhood friend and love interest, Strawberry Fields. And I know a lot of people wondered why she was Strawberry Fields when there was already lovely Rita on the album. But I can explain that. Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane were originally intended to be on the Sgt. Pepper album, and they were left out, which makes sense, because they sound like Sgt. Pepper songs. So that's probably why the screenwriter used Strawberry Fields Forever in the movie. Anyway, the band gets a letter from B.D. Brockhurst, who tells them that he wants to give them a record deal if they can get him a demo tape, and Mr. Kite fantasizes about being a superstar like Billy and the Hendersons are about to be. They get to recording, and we meet Mean Mr. Mustard, an agent for the organization FVB, whose main motto is, We hate love, we hate joy, we love money, remember, losers can be winners. Ah, so FVB were behind the first two J.J. Abrams Star Trek movies. Anyway, FVB tells him of their plan to allow him to take over Heartlands, so that he can have everything he wants, including Strawberry Fields. Forever. I apologize for that joke. I'll escort myself out. B.D. Brockhurst loves their tape, and so he tells them to be in L.A. by the next day, and the group, plus Dougie, jump to it. Billy spends one more night with Strawberry before heading out to L.A., where Dougie becomes enamored with Brockhurst's assistant, Lucy. Brockhurst shows them around Hollywood, and they become fully indoctrinated in the city, and they produce their first album. But, back in Heartland, Mr. Mustard has taken over the city after stealing the instruments. Strawberry leaves town to find the band and hope that they can save Heartland, and perhaps the world, from the clutches of Mr. Mustard and FVB. Mr. Mustard is ordered to pass off the instruments to various other members of FVB, including Dr. Maxwell Edison, a sadistic doctor who gets the saxophone, Father Son, a loser crossing guard who gets the coronet, and FVB themselves. Plus, he saves an instrument for himself, the bass drum. Billy, the band, and Strawberry rush around trying to get them back, fighting off FVB's forces, though they can't locate FVB and the final instrument. 
They succeed, and everything goes mostly well, except for Brockhurst, Dougie, and Lucy, since the band called off their tour to do this and they're losing money. All is not lost, though, since they hold a benefit for Heartland, which helps them, but ends with Strawberry and the instruments being taken again by Mustard back to FVB's headquarters, where it's revealed that they're the future villain band. And we finally get an explanation for the name. Their leader's name is Sal Future Villain. So the band is named after him, not that they're a band that's going to be villainous in the future. It's still dumb, but it's not nearly as dumb as it originally was. Sal's intent was to use the magic instruments to brainwash the world and create an army. Why? Because he was a failed musician, and after years of rejections, he snapped and became a supervillain. Though, to be honest, he is more like a Kim Possible villain than a Bond villain. Remember Frugal Luker, the evil retail guy? Sal is like him. Billy and the band fight FVB, and in the ensuing scuffle, Strawberry is killed, driving Billy into a pit of despair. After the funeral, Billy goes to commit suicide at a window, but is saved at the last second when the Sergeant Pepper Weathervane comes to life, and tells Billy that he believes in happy endings. And so he renews the show for another season. Oh yeah, and he turns Mr. Mustard, Dougie, and Lucy into an altar boy, a priest, and a nun respectively, and tells them to do only good, and transforms Brockhurst back into the vacuum salesman he was before he was a record mogul, and tells them that he's given him another shot, but to do it right this time. And, as was my biggest gripe with the movie, he grabs Strawberry's body from her coffin and resurrects her. Billy, Strawberry, Mark, Dave, and Bob stand together on a bandstand reunited by Sergeant Pepper. Then Sergeant Pepper tells them to be the stars of their dreams and shows them all the bands that inspired them. And I kid you not, we get six pages listing out all the musical artists from the era before the novel ends with a rendition of the final song from the album. We'll be right back with more of the show. And we're back. So one of the issues with the film was that there was a lack of backstory. We got bare-bones stuff for everyone except Sgt. Pepper himself. But the novelization has so much backstory. We get backstory on every single character. Not just Billy the Hendersons, the Shears, the Fields, Mr. Mustard, Father Son, Maxwell Edison, and FVB, but every goddamn person in Heartland has backstory. I mean, it's good that we get backstory for the original band, but this is ridiculous. We get backstory for the goddamn mailman. We get backstory for the teacher, the banker, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. Even the damn milkman probably gets backstory. And it's so boring and takes away from the characters that I care about. It's just info dump after info dump. What I can say is that the characters make a lot more sense. I mean, FVB has motivation in this. Mustard has a reason to take over Heartland. And they explained how FVB found those losers to recruit. By having them take aptitude tests that basically told them, You're a complete loser! And that's what FVB were looking for in their world-stopping musical empire. Honestly, I can sort of see why they're so miserable thanks to Edwards going into detail on their backstories. They're still jerks, but at least now we know why they're jerks, and it makes them more effective bad guys. Well, as effective as Frankie Howard, Steve Martin, Alice Cooper, and Aerosmith can be. Billy and the band are actually characters in this, as opposed to just being the singers in the movie, and it's actually cool to see their backstories and individual tastes and stuff. Plus, we get some backstory on the relationship between Billy and Strawberry, which makes me actually care about their relationship, unlike in the movie, where it just told me to be invested in it. 
Oh, and I'm still pissed off about that crap with Dougie being evil from the start. He was greedy, but that might be because his adoptive grandfather hated his guts. Did Sergeant Pepper even attempt to foster a relationship with his step-grandson? I'm not saying Dougie was a paragon of good like his stepbrother, but come on. Honestly, the story and everything else makes sense. It's a narrative, and aside from the backstory on backstory we got that bogged it down, the plot moves pretty smoothly. It is weird that we had this whole benefit concert in the middle of the FVB plot, but because of it we got Earth, Wind, and Fire's rendition of Gotta Get You Into My Life, so I forgive it. The book also has great descriptions of the visuals. I was a little unsure that a novelization could get across the insane 70s visuals of the movie, but this book gave it wonderfully. I mean, Edwards is great with the prose, giving us beautiful descriptions of Heartland, of the characters, even of their interactions. I mean, the scene where Billy and Strawberry are reunited when she comes to the studio after Mustard takes over Heartland, in the movie, it was okay. But in the book, it's written so well that I actually felt the emotions. When I saw the movie, my emotions weren't tugged at at all. I wasn't sad when Strawberry died, but in the novel, I felt something. Even though I had already seen the film and knew the ending, I was sad during the funeral, and that's without the music. The songs being given through little segments was weird, but I gotta admit, it worked for the book. Plus, it let me have a little reprieve where I could sing along to my favorite Beatles songs. The story is cohesive, and the characters seem to be acting within the parameters set by the author at the beginning. And the author is really good. It's a shame that his only other IMDb credit is The Great Skycopter Rescue. And I can't figure out if he ever wrote any other novels. Though he may have written a book about David Bowie in the 80s, but I can't confirm that it's the same Henry Edwards. The story, aside from the obvious lack of music, seems to actually work better when it has time to breathe in a 190-page story, as opposed to a two-hour movie. Everything is much clearer, and the beats of the story move much better than they did in the film. The book is fantastic. It boggles my mind that it exists, but it's a great read. It's also pretty damn hard to find, since it's an obscure book from the 70s. All I can say is that if you can get your hands on it and enjoy the movie, you'll love the book even more. And if you hated the movie, this might make you like it, because it explains a lot of the dumber stuff. There is just one issue that I have. They never explain why the weather vane is Billy Preston. Everyone just acts like he's Sergeant Pepper, which is all fine and good. I'm not trying to whitewash Sergeant Pepper, but that's the one thing I hope to find out in the novelization. I mean, it's possible that because it's a novelization, I'm supposed to assume it was whoever I envisioned as Sergeant Pepper, but still, was he always Billy Preston? And they don't even go into the major ramifications of Sergeant Pepper returning to life. Is this permanent, or is it just for this one thing? Like I said, it raised more questions than it answered. Regardless, the book is fantastic, and if you're a Beatles fan, Bee Gees fan, or a 70s schlock fan, you'll get a kick out of this book. And that was Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Was it good? Against all odds, yeah. The prose is beautiful, and Henry Edwards manages to bring Heartland to life on the pages in a way that not even the movie could. I love the movie, and I love the novelization for completely different reasons. The movie I love because of the music and the absurdity. The book I love for its writing. I genuinely cannot believe that I'm sitting here on the 50th anniversary of the U.S. release of Sgt. Pepper, giving a glowing review to a book that, for all intents and purposes, should be terrible. I guess the tagline was right. A splendid time was guaranteed for all. 
Anyway, that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more of the Literary Lair, you can hit that subscribe button. And if you have any comments or complaints about the video, you can put those in the comment section below. And if you enjoyed this video, show it to your friends and share it around the internet. And maybe consider supporting the show on Patreon. Come back next week for Classic Novel Month 5, the final read tier. See you then. Come back next week for Classic Novel Month 5, the final read tier. Fuck, I fucked up. Anyway, that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more of the literary lair, you can hit that subscribe button. And if you... No, I had that. I had it. <laughs>